All right, so we can go ahead and get started. For those joining us from home, Molly just brought cookies, so that's one of the perks you only get if you if you come in person. Um, just gotta have those incentives. So tonight we have Brother Bernard, a native of Ohio, of St. Henry, Ohio, um, giving us a talk this evening. Brother Bernard finished his second year at the House of Studies this past year. Uh, so he's been a Dominican, been wearing the habit for three years now. Um, and very grateful for his ministry. This summer is an important one, so we don't necessarily see it a lot here at St. Patrick's, but he's spending a, a six hours a day during the week at the hospitals helping Father Dean Matthewson in the important work of hospital ministry in, the, in a collection of different hospitals. So he's getting some great ministry experience there so we can keep his ministry in our prayers and those he is accompanying and, uh, and doing ministry for. So tonight we have a talk on the Liturgy of the Hours, Praying Without Ceasing. Let's welcome Brother Bernard. Uh, why don't we begin by, uh, by praying. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. St. Patrick, St. Dominic, St. Benedict. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it was actually not planned at all that this was going to be on the Feast of St. Benedict, but how appropriate that we're talking about the Liturgy of the Hours on the Feast of uh, kind of the founder of Western monasticism, and uh, in many ways an, an innovator as far as helping to, to develop the Western tradition of the Liturgy of the Hours. So we'll talk a little bit more of that as we go along. Um, but thank you, Father Raymond, for having me come to speak tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to talk about a prayer of the church that means a lot to me uh, as a Dominican friar, uh, personally. And uh, when he asked what topic I wanted to speak on, um, I thought of a number of ideas. But the Liturgy of the Hours came to mind for a number of reasons. Um, foremost among those is because the Liturgy of the Hours is a part of the overall Liturgy of the Church. We often think of the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And everybody, every Catholic is, of course, required to be at Mass every Sunday and for Holy Days of Obligation. But it's kind of like the minimum participation in the overall liturgy of the Church, which is more than even its daily Mass. But it's the extension of the Mass into individual hours, as they say, of prayer through the day. And uh, the Church has always kind of saw this as fitting uh, in fulfilling or corresponding with St. Paul's words to pray ceaselessly, to pray constantly. And uh, even Christ himself said, pray always. Um, in the Gospel of, of Luke, we can read that. So um, the liturgy, uh, Vatican II says, is the summit towards which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all her powers flow. For the aim and object of apostolic works is that all who are made sons of God by faith and baptism should come together to praise God in the midst of his church, to take part in the sacrifice, and to eat the Lord's Supper. So it's the font, it's where we come for those graces that allow us to do apostolic work, and it's um, what we return to. The liturgy is what we return to, um, to uh, basically be with our primary aim as Christians, and that is Christ. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about how the liturgy is related to Jesus himself in, in a moment. Um, secondly, I want to talk about this because um, the liturgy corresponds also with St. Paul's words that we do not know how to pray as we ought. And we know that passage from uh, his letter to the Romans. We don't know how to pray. So how do we pray? Well, the church gives us a prayer. Uh, God has given us a prayer through the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. And it's the liturgy of the church. And the liturgy can sometimes force us to think in a new way. And it's great for that reason, because we don't come to worship as we please. It's not a matter of what feels good or what, um, what makes me feel connected with God. It's a matter of taking what God gives us and then conforming ourselves to that as 
the manner of worship that he desires for us and that manner of worship that's going to allow us to truly enter into prayer and to enter into the life of God. Um, St. Benedict, uh, he said that our mind must accord with our voice. This is kind of a famous um, part of his rule that the church even quotes in all of her documents on the Liturgy of the Hours. Our mind must be in accord with our voice. So you think about praying the liturgy, and um, it looks like some of you have already prayed the hours. So you pray these psalms, and sometimes they're a little bit alien. Um, we're talking about tonight was the king or the kings of Sheba and Seba, and you're like, who the heck are these guys? Um, but then sometimes you talk about things that are very directly connected to our lives. Um, a couple days ago for midday prayer, we read about how deep wounding betrayal is, especially from a close friend. And these are like parts of life that we all experience. So some dimensions of the church's prayer life are very much in tune and resonant with how we experience life. And sometimes they're just very crazy, weird, like kind of foreign things. And, uh, and oftentimes we're kind of in the middle, somewhere in the middle there. And when we make our minds conform to the way our voices sing and pray, we are sort of reprogramming our minds to think like God thinks. And we're reprogramming our hearts to beat as God's heart beats. So we surround ourselves, and the third reason I want to talk about this, by a sort of secular liturgy of the hours each day. Um, and some of us to more or less degrees. We wake up in the morning, and instead of asking our Lord to open our lips in praise, we unlock our cell phones, and suddenly we're entering into a field of text that has nothing to do with our Lord or our faith or even our practical lives. Um, throughout the day, we carry around a phone in our hands instead of a breviary in our hands. You would have seen you know, priests of old carrying the breviary with them and I, in fact, I see in, in the rectory there, we've got a number of pictures of old priests from the 19th century, and they've always got their breviary at their side. And uh, it was kind of like a part of their actual person in, in the way that our cell phones tend to be a part of our actual persons today. So how do we fill up our day, and how do we punctuate our day? Is it by periodically checking Facebook, or is it by periodically checking in with the Psalms to help our minds attune to our voices and be conformed to the ways of God. So this is one more reason why the Liturgy of the Hours is especially important in today's world um, where there's so much uh, sensory, uh, so much sensory stimuli and it's not incense and it's not bells. Um, it's, uh, it's the sounds and smells of the world and they can, they can be destructive to our spiritual lives. The fourth reason I wanna talk about the Liturgy of the Hours is because I've personally come to really love the Liturgy of the Hours in particular is a part of the church's prayer life. Uh, when I was, uh, well actually when I was in college, that was my first time being exposed to the Liturgy of the Hours. A, a good friend of mine um, invited me to go on a retreat with him at St. Minerad Arch Abbey in southern Indiana. And I don't know if any of you have been out there, but it's this beautiful uh, monastery, kind of on a hill and in, in just, just west of the Hoosier Forest. And uh, it's these old, I think Swiss uh, Catholic monks um, that founded a monastery there, St. Meinrad's. And I saw the monks praying in choir in their church when I arrived there for that uh, retreat weekend. And it really kind of uh, uh, captured my imagination. And I was very inspired by that. It was moving to see uh, them praying together so frequently through the day. They rise um, somewhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock, you know, for the first hour of prayer. And then they end the day and it's dark out and it's the most... I don't know, it's probably the most, uh, um, the most I felt like where my whole day was consecrated to prayer was when I was at that monastery praying those hours on a regular basis. And, uh, and I could probably talk more about my personal experience with the hours, but I know when I was thinking about priesthood and, and I was initially attracted to religious life and um, I started out in one particular direction and I was with a society of apostolic life um, but one thing I discovered within just the first two years of my formation with this other um, order was that they didn't pray the Liturgy of the Hours together as often. And that's okay because not all orders do. Um, secular pri or diocesan priests, um, they often pray them in private. But I found myself really wanting to pray them in common with my brothers. So when I found the Dominicans, it was, it was like a perfect fit. I could do apostolic work and still have this kind of monastic uh, way of praying throughout the day. So... I think the Liturgy of the Hours is very important, and I think we should all think they're important as well. So I want to talk about tonight what they are, 
um, where they come from. I want to talk a little bit about the mechanics and what they consist of. And then uh, hopefully we'll have time for some questions. And then we'll end the evening tonight by praying Compline together. So if nothing else, if everything else fails and, and nothing sticks in the actual talk itself, hopefully praying Compline together will leave an impression of just how it can look like to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. So we'll do that over in the chapel um, when I finish uh, speaking this evening. So the first question to ask um, about the Liturgy of the Hours is, is what are they? And we have to begin by asking what the word liturgy means in the first place and where we get the word liturgy. And like a lot of like Catholic lingo, it can be, uh, we can use these words often and not know what they mean. I mean, what does Eucharist mean? What does liturgy mean? Uh, what does the presbyterate mean? These all come from usually Greek or Latin words. Uh, this particular word, um, lit liturgy, comes from a, uh, a Greek word, light. Uh, light toward Gios, which um, is actually how this um, this verse of Luke is translated. Um, this is talking about the, the priest Zechariah, and we have him um, having just come from offering incense in the ta in the temple at the hour of prayer. And he's been struck dumb, right? He had that revelation. The angel appeared to him and said that his wife would conceive of a son. And he disbelieved. And this verse says, and when his time of service was ended. And this is where we see this, this strange Greek word, leitorgias, um, which meant something in the Greek world like a public service or a public act. Um, and the church adopts this word and Christianity adopts this word. And it does mean something like service. It's a public service. It's a, it's a communal service. And um, we call things in, I mean, we, we name the liturgy just that, the liturgy. Uh, there are a number of other names for the liturgy of the hours. You probably have heard it called the divine office. Um, the divine office, which seems like an even, I mean, what, is, what does an office have anything to do with the liturgy? Um, and I found this interesting. I actually just discovered this when I was looking to put the talk together. But the Latin word for service in light or gias here is officii, officium. So we see both names present right here in this one verse um, relating to priestly um, sacrifice and, and worship in the temple. Uh, in Greek, liturgy, and in Latin, office. So if we call it the divine office or if we call it the liturgy of the hours, we're, 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 we're talking about the same thing. And this is uh, a priestly action. It's a priestly, uh, it's a priestly prayer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the liturgy is an action of the whole Christ. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard the, that phrase, whole Christ. Um, it's Christus totus in Latin. This is the body of Christ as the believers of the church, the faithful gathered together in the church. St. Paul talks about the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And that body united with its head, Christ. In glory and Christ um, interceding for us at the with the Father in heaven so the action of the whole Christ so when we enter into any liturgical act we do so as the church as the body of Christ with Christ as our head and the liturgy is an action of Christ ultimately us participating in the priestly office of Christ himself which is why um, the church teaches uh, and Pius, uh, Pius XII put it this way in his encyclical on the liturgy. He said, the church prolongs the priestly mission of Jesus Christ mainly by means of the sacred liturgy. So by virtue of each of our baptisms, us having become sons and daughters of God, having put on Christ and having Christ live in us, we share in a common priesthood of all believers. And worship is one way of expressing that common priesthood. And Sacrosanctum Concilium of the Vatican II says that we each do that proper um, to our state in life. So a priest will engage in that in a certain way, and the laity will engage in that in a certain way, and a bishop in a certain way. And you see that probably more clearly in, in the Mass, uh, where there's kind of designated roles. The Liturgy of the Hours is a bit more um, uh, uniform in terms of participation. You'll have a priest give a blessing at the end. And there may be some incensing of an altar during Vespers or something like this. But overall, it's, uh, it consists of the body of believers um, 
chanting together um, in a sort of unity the psalms of the church, the, the prayers of the church, the scriptures of the church. So I want to talk a little bit about the origins of the Liturgy of the Hours, um, and this will help us understand it better. Of course, it's connected with, um, with the whole cult of Judaism, and it begins um, at the very beginning of the Bible. We've been reading through it, actually, in the Liturgy of the Hours currently in the Office of Readings. I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, it's probably the most dynamically represented when the people are call, called out of Egypt by God uh, to render service to him in the wilderness. And it's interesting that, that the Hebrew, I don't know what the Hebrew word is, but it's also translated service. God calls them to offer service in the wilderness. And he forms a people, and he gives them, you know, it's, it's these books of the Bible that are so hard to read sometimes. It's like this immense amount of detail describing the, the tabernacle and what priests wear and the jewels and the linen and how long and how high and how often and in what way and if you don't do this and if you do this. And um, it's a very elaborate, um, I mean, we call it a, a, a cult. It's, it's their way of offering sacrifice and praise and worship. And the big thing to take away from that is that that comes from God. That whole, um, that whole uh, way of living in the presence of God and worshiping is given by God. And it's not something that we make up or we produce. It's, uh, it's something given to us. And that was important at the time of the Israelites because you had all these foreign cults. You had Babylonia and you had Mesopotamia and you had the Egyptians. And they all had their gods and goddesses. And God wants us to worship him in, in the way God wishes to be worshipped. That's true worship would be. Now, all that kind of culminates in the temple and the sacrifice, sacrifices offered there. But the exile happens, synagogues are established, and they alter their way of praying because they no longer have the temple to pray in. And this is the origin of the Jewish custom of praying at certain hours of the day. They would be at the synagogues to offer morning prayer. There would be an afternoon prayer. Um, and later that would be associated with the evening sacrifice in the temple. So while there was a sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem, all the synagogues and all the people would be united in prayer in the afternoon. And then there was an evening or a night, a night prayer. Um, so these three hours um, were a part of the Jewish prayer life. And Jesus himself would have known these, these three periods of prayer. And we read about this um, in, in the uh, actual New Testament. So the apostles um, at Pentecost, for example, right, they were accused of being drunk, and Peter stands up and he says that it was only the third hour. So why were they gathered in the upper room for Pentecost at the third hour? They were there for prayer. Or we read later um, in chapter 10 of Acts, the next day as they were on their journey and coming near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Or we read again in Cornelius four days ago about this hour um, oh he says this four days ago at about this hour I was keeping the ninth hour of prayer in my house so and here's a here's an explicit example of this hour of prayer being kept in his own home so he's not at a synagogue he's not at the temple um, and in fact he's not even Jewish by blood Cornelius and he's praying at the ninth hour in his home so these are um, these uh, these particular hours are where we get our names for kind of the center of the Liturgy of the Hours. Currently, it consists of seven hours. And the three hours I'm talking about right now, traditionally 9 a.m., 12 noon, and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And the Latin terse just means the third hour, which they started at 6 o'clock in the morning was the first hour. And then three hours later, we have 9, and it's the third hour. The sixth hour is sext, and the ninth hour is known. So these Latin words just correspond to those those numerations, the third, the sixth, and the ninth. And this is the Jewish origin of those particular hours. Now later we kind of adapt um, things. The church um, uh, liturgy obviously develops. Um, the way that Christians worship is different than the way Jews worship. And a lot of that has to do with Jesus having introduced a new way of praying. So we had Mount Sinai and God gives the instructions for the building of a tabernacle and he gives them uh, um, many of their prayers but then the new Moses on the Sermon on the Mount gives a new way of praying. And we just uh, finished reading all those passages in Mass in the past couple of weeks. 
So they asked Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus, uh, he responds, pray um, neither as the hypocrites, but as the Lord commanded in his gospel. Thus pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he teaches us a new prayer. And that becomes incorporated into these Jewish hours of prayer. So now um, in the early church, um, I don't know if you've all heard of the Didache. Um, this is one of the earliest kind of Christian texts. It's a non-biblical text, but it was a text written in the first century. And it kind of describes the whole Christian life in, in a very summary fashion. It's, it's about a page and a half long. You could read the whole thing in 10 minutes. If you have not read the Didache, I encourage you to do so because it's invaluable in understanding how early Christian um, life um, was um, past the time of St. Paul and, uh, and the, the apostles. But there, um, they list the Our Father as something to be prayed, and they say, thrice in the day, pray thus. So there's a specific admonition to pray three times the Our Father each day. Now, we see this today in the liturgy, and early on in the church, um, um, it was established this way, that in morning prayer and in evening prayer, we would pray the Our Father. And then every day at Mass, we pray the Our Father. So three times a day in the liturgy of the church, the hours in the Mass combined, we pray the Our Father three times, just as they did in the early church. So it's important to see just how there's a lot of continuity here um, between the way we worship as Christians today and how they did in the very first century of the church. They also added um, things like doxologies. So we, we say the, the glory be. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. They would add that at the end of each psalm, that they would pray during these hours of prayer. And this was to remind us that the psalms, and the fathers of the church spoke um, emphatically about this, but the psalms speak about Christ, or they're the words of Christ himself. So if we're talking about the kings of Sheba and Seba, of course there's a historical dimension to that. But somehow that psalm is, um, it points to Jesus Christ. So at the end of every psalm, we invoke the Holy Trinity, which of course mentions Jesus, but it's, it gives the whole um, time of prayer a Trinitarian dimension. It's a very Christian um, dimension to these hours of Jewish prayer. Um, one thing I found interesting about the early offices of the church um, is that, so before I mention that, the third hour and the ninth hour, these morning and, and uh, evening hours of Jewish prayer, they kind of become what the church calls lauds and vespers, uh, morning prayer and evening prayer. And then these, these uh, hours during the day um, become a separate sort of set of hours. But these, these became the most important hours, the, the morning prayer and the evening prayer of the church. And they're more elaborate. There's more to them than the other hours of prayer. And those are the, those are the hours you pray the Our Father. You pray the, the Canticle of Mary or the Canticle of Zechariah. And it was actually... Um, mandatory for all Christians to go to these hours of prayer. So we think about Sunday Mass obligation as being such a burden. You know, so many people think that, oh, how, what, who's the church to say I should go to church, you know, church every Sunday? And then here we have the early Christians, and they're expected to be at morning prayer and evening prayer daily, which is an incredible thing. I, I, I was kind of blown away by that, but it, it, it shows you a couple things, just how devoted the early church was to prayer. And also that this was, um, this was not just the duty of religious and priests. This was the duty of every Christian to enter into the liturgy of the church. And, uh, and we're reminded of that more in recent uh, magisterial documents, that this is a prayer of all the people of the church. Uh, St. Hippolytus, uh, funny enough, he, meant, he, he lists um, the hours kind of in their traditional order. Um, he wrote in the early 3rd century, so now we're a couple hundred years after Christ. And he, he lists basically all the main hours. Um, he speaks about the 9 a.m. third hour of prayer, the sixth hour, the ninth hour. He mentions midnight prayer, and he mentions cock crow, which I'm guessing 2 a.m., cock crow. So you pray a cock crow, and that later becomes what the church calls matins or vigils. Um, and then that's in addition to the two hours of morning and evening prayer. So we end up with a total of seven. In Psalm 119, um, the psalmist says, Seven times a day I praise you. So here we have another biblical dimension to the, the prayer of the church. Seven times a day I, pray, I praise you. Um, but he says at the midnight hour, uh, quote, And if you have a wife, both of you pray together. 
And he's talking about the midnight hour, right? We're not even talking about morning and evening prayer anymore. But he says, get up with your wife and pray with her at midnight. So again, just to show you how important this was for the early church. Um, I could read a number of other fathers, but um, we don't have time for that. Uh, overall developments, monasticism, St. Benedict, St. Pacomius, the Desert Fathers, they, they begin to transform this a little bit. They add all the Psalms to the hours of prayer. Um, they would at some points pray all the Psalms in one day, which is a lot. That's a, I mean, that's, if you can think about praying, it's about like 20 psalms per hour of prayer. So, and we do currently about three psalms per hour. So um, maybe uh, seven times as many psalms they would pray. And, uh, and the psalms became incorporated, and certain psalms became associated with certain hours of the day. And we still use these same psalms today. Psalm 62 was associated with morning prayer, and we pray that on Sunday mornings, and we pray that on major feast days. Um, certain evening prayers, the uh, Psalms of Ascent were associated with evening prayers. So you start to see certain Psalms associated with certain hours of the day. Um, night prayer, Psalms would be more eschatological. They would be more looking towards um, uh, the end times or towards heaven. Uh, Vespers would be songs of thankfulness for the day. Um, so you can see how the Psalms relate again to our daily lives. Um, and as monasticism took off, um, the laity began to be less involved in the Liturgy of the Hours, but they still were. Um, for hundreds of years, uh, Vespers especially was an important prayer for the, the, the Christian people. They would gather together at cathedrals usually to pray Vespers with the bishop. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful image of the church together at prayer um, with their, their head shepherd. And then Vatican II uh, made a number of um, um, encouragements uh, and, uh, and a lot of that had to do with restoring the whole Liturgy of the Hours to kind of a simpler form and something more, um, uh, more reasonable as far as um, the, time, the time involved in praying it. So currently it takes um, four weeks to pray all the Psalms. So it's a four-week cycle of Psalms. And before Vatican II, it was a one-week cycle of Psalms, which was a lot less than the one-day cycle of Psalms that the, the early fathers had. Um, so four weeks is, is, um, is a bit more manageable. Um, let's talk about the mechanics. So that's, that's kind of the broad history. I mean, it's, it's interesting. And I think uh, the big takeaway is how, how, um, how it's rooted in Jewish worship and how it's, it's richly biblical. The whole concept of the Liturgy of the Hours is a very biblical um, prayer. So the Hours um, consists of uh, the ones I have written on the board. Matins, um, the word matins comes from the Latin word matutinus, which means something pertaining to morning. So these were, um, for, for many years, prayed in, in the morning. So 2 a.m. is a guess. I don't know. I, I put in parentheses the ones that really don't have a, a specific hour associated with them, but that could be when they were prayed. Um, but the Office of Readings is what it's now called in English. And uh, its characters changed a little bit. It's, not so mu it's, it's still to retain its morning character, um, but it can actually be prayed any time during the day. So uh, matins, um, you can pray it um, really at any point. And uh, oftentimes, us Dominicans will pair it with a different hour. So we'll pray matins and lauds all at once, or we'll pray matins and vespers all at once. So it's a flexible hour. But traditionally, it was a morning, it was a morning hour. Lauds, the word lauds comes from the Latin word laudate, which means to praise. Um, it's, uh, it's a word that was found in a number of psalms at the end of the Psalter, um, specifically oriented towards the praise of God. And you'll note that in your, in your breviaries, the, the third psalm in morning prayer is always something more upbeat than the previous two. It's always something having to do with glorifying and praising God. And uh, these were the morning praises. And then I've already explained the three middle hours. We call these uh, midday prayer now. And uh, you can pray any one of these and fulfill the canonical obligation, or priests can fulfill the canonical obligation of praying um, at least one of these hours. And then Vespers um, comes from the Greek Hespera. There's Vesper also in, in Latin, and it just means evening. Um, and then Compline, which um, is another Latin word, and it's related to the word complete in English. It's the completion of the day. And to my knowledge, St. Benedict is actually the first person to kind of use that word in this sense for the hour of prayer, the, 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 the hour of Compline, which is what we will pray tonight. 
the, uh, each of the hours roughly consists in a number of parts, um, the first being an invocation to prayer. So a big part about the liturgy is that, again, St. Paul says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. So we always have to ask for God's assistance in praying. So the very first hour of the day, we say, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. That's a direct quote from Psalm 51, and it's acknowledging the fact that God has to be the one praying. Jesus has to be the one praying through us. Again, this is a participation in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. After the invocation, um, for night prayer, there's an examination of conscience. But for every other hour of the day, we sing a hymn. And... Most of us know hymns from the Mass, but traditionally, hymns were not sung during Mass. Hymns were sung during the Liturgy of the Hours. So they were traditional hymns. Um, certain saints, like St. Ambrose, were especially well known for having composed these beautiful hymns. Um, and, uh, and certain hymns are associated, again, with certain hours of the day. Um, our Greek teacher at the Dominican House of Studies, she, she works on translating these ancient texts um, for the church. Um, there's a commission of translators. And she just told me this year that finally they have finished translating the English version of the, of, the, of the official Roman hymnal. So if you have the Liturgy of the Hours, and it's this, this four-book um, set, um, all the hymns in there, I mean, it's kind, of, it's kind of a scattershot. There's all kinds of different hymns in there. They're not, they're not kind of the traditional hymns of the church. And uh, now it sounds like they're on their way, so maybe they'll publish them sometime soon. After the hymn, you have uh, a set of psalms, usually three. And they're all prefaced by an antiphon. And the antiphon is kind of a one-line strophe that expresses an idea that's in the psalm, or it expresses an idea related to the feast day that you're celebrating that day. Um, if it's the Feast of St. Benedict, it might mention something about discipleship or following Christ or giving all you have to the poor. After the antiphon is the psalm itself followed by the doxology. So again, you finish each of these uh, psalms by acknowledging its Trinitarian character, its um, Christocentrism. After your set of psalms, there's a reading. And these vary in length, depending on the hour. Um, the, 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 the midday hours all have shorter readings. Compline has the shortest reading. And then evening prayer and morning prayer have a bit longer readings, and uh, they're more of a, of a continuous reading. But, I, I mean, the Office of Readings obviously has the most extensive readings. And the Office of Readings, um, if, you pray no, pray, um, if you pray nothing else, pray morning prayer and evening prayer because they are the hinge hours. They're the most important. But the Office of Readings, um, I think, is something that all of us can really learn from because they kind of commit you to reading the Bible on a regular basis, and they select the most important, I mean, kind of the most important passages for a continuous reading. You're not going to get the Gospels. The Gospels are reserved for Mass, appropriately enough. They're the most important part of the Bible, and they're proclaimed during the Liturgy of the Word in the Mass. But for most of your big narratives, for, um, for a lot of your other readings, there's a continuous reading in the liturgy of the office of readings and then after the, the 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 scripture reading there's always a reading from the fathers or from holy men and women sometimes a saint of the day and uh, if you don't have any exposure to the fathers of the church this is a great way to learn about the teachings of the fathers of the church and again they're handpicked um, some of the most uh, profound passages uh, and they're kind of given weight depending on the father augustine has tons of readings uh, you'll see a few by St. Bernard. You'll see less by figures like St. Fulgenti Fulgentius of Rus, I don't know, some like kind of random names that maybe we've never heard about before. After the readings, there's always a response, so or a responsory. And this is kind of a way to acknowledge what's just been read to deepen or help it sink in. And usually it's a call and response. Somebody will read the first part, the, the leader, um, the hebdomadarian, as we call them in Latin, and then the, the congregation will respond with the second phrase. And then after the response, for certain hours of the day, 
morning prayer, evening prayer, and night prayer, there's a canticle from the gospel. So this is actually the only place where you're going to see the gospel read in the Liturgy of the Hours is during these Christian hymns. So the morning prayer, you have Zechariah's song, the Benedictus. An evening prayer, you're going to have Mary's song, and we sing the Magnificat every night. And then at night prayer, we sing the canticle of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis. Um, this is, um, and we'll pray that tonight. So then after the canticle, the gospel canticle, for morning and evening prayers, there's intercessions. And followed the, following the intercessions in morning and evening prayers, the Our Father. And then there's a closing prayer. And a final blessing. Um, so that's kind of the, the general structure. And if you think about it, a lot of it is familiar to us in the Mass. You know, you have some kind of an opening uh, part, of the, part of the liturgy. There's an Old Testament reading. And then there's a New Testament reading. There's a psalm. There's a gospel reading. And there's intercessions in every Mass. And it's kind of mirrored a little bit in the Liturgy of the Hours. It's, there's a kind of a uniformity in the Church's prayer life. So when and where should you pray the Liturgy of the Hours? So it's pretty easy if you're a monk. You've got your chapel, you've got your horarium, you just show up and you pray. But if you have a home, then what do you do? Or, you know, you're working or whatever else. Um, so I'll give a couple examples. So I was with um, another religious order one summer, and we were at the uh, World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia. And for whatever reason, the morning was crazy, and we did not get... Lauds in. We just did not get morning prayer in that morning. So we're at the bus stop, and uh, the prior says, okay, we're going to pray lauds now. So we're at the bus stop, and we start praying lauds. And we're about halfway through. The bus shows up. We get on the bus. We sit down, and we keep praying. <laughs> we're, like, chanting the psalms, and the people on the bus are just silent, you know. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? Uh, it was actually kind of cool because they, uh, they were respectfully silent. And then when we got done, we had some interesting conversations with the folks on <laughs> the bus. Um, but, you know, out of necessity, and the friars, we all know how to pray car, car vespers or car lauds. You know, this is a common part of Dominican life. You know, we're on the road, and uh, we'll pray in the car. And usually we'll sing, and it's just, it's kind of fun. You know, it's like, okay, here we go. We're, it's, it's 5 o'clock, so we're going to pray vespers. Um, and then I was, with, um, I was with another family in Steubenville one, one year. I was going to a conference. We stopped at a family's house. And they had a couple of young kids, and they invited us to pray uh, to pray lauds with them. Uh, and uh, we sat down with them in their living room on their couch, and we started praying lauds. And uh, about halfway through, their three-year-old comes out with a vacuum a vacuum cleaner, you know, running across the living room. And and mom had to tell her it's not the right time to vacuum the carpet. So, you know, it, you can have interruptions, and it can it doesn't have to be in in the most like. Uh, a, you know, liturgically appropriate of places if you're praying some of these hours during the day. But there's something special about just whatever you're doing, committing to it. And, uh, and in spite of distractions and other things going around, vacuum cleaners, buses, you can, you can, you can, you can sing the praises of the church and join in in this. The uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium says this is a hymn sung by Christ um, through the ages. And we join in this heavenly hymn. It's it's, it's something that prayer, the church has been praying for years, and we get, we get to participate in that. Um, so I probably don't have to emphasize that this is a prayer um, for everybody, and uh, the church encourages the laity to pray the Liturgy of the Hours. In fact, Vatican II says, this blew me away, it says, Pastors of souls should see to it that the chief hours, especially Vespers, are celebrated in common in church on Sundays and on more solemn feasts. And the laity, too, are encouraged to recite the divine office, either with priests or among themselves or even individually. So there's like a very specific exhortation to have vespers on Sundays in your local parish. So I don't, I, I don't know what's, what's happened at St. Pat's in the past or currently, but it might be something to talk about um, if, if the parish is interested in gathering for vespers. That could be a very beautiful way of living out the Vatican to call to um, renew the Liturgy of the Hours as a part of your life. Um, another idea for parents, I, I met a family this past week that said that for confirmation, they always give their kids the four volume set of the Liturgy of the Hours as their confirmation present. And I thought that was pretty sweet, you know, and uh, they said that one of their daughters was just thrilled to, 
to receive that as your confirmation gift. And, um, and again, it's something that might, I don't know, it might um, inspire them to make that a, a part of their routine prayer life. Um, where can you get the Liturgy of the Hours? Again, practical things, because we're running out of time here. So this is, this is again, the standard set. Um, it's not as intimidating as it looks. Probably, if uh, you take out the repeated material, the actual content would be something like this, if it was one book. But because of the Office of Readings, you have all these, you know, it's like basically a Bible inside of this, kind of, and um, sort of a, a small selection of the Church Fathers. And then in each of the each of these volumes, they're all this is this is Advent and Christmas, um, this is Lent and Easter, and then these two are for the weeks of ordinary time, and then in each of these books, the center is the most important part. So the center is going to be the Psalter. So these are the Psalms, and this is what you're spending most of your time in, which is kind of I mean just mechanically nice because the book lies flat when you're in the middle sections, you know, and then and then. If you work your way out from the middle, there's increasingly less parts of the breviary. So the first part is the proper season. So you just have things specific to the day. Um, and then after that's the proper saints. So it's things specific to whatever saint you're celebrating that day, if there is one. And then in the very back, you have the commons, which is just what certain saints share. So maybe there's a set of psalms that virgins um, share in common, or apostles, or pastors. And... I think I heard somebody talking before we started tonight about how it's kind of complicated and you want to learn just how to do the mechanical part of it a little bit better. Um, a couple a couple recommendations is um, there is like an online version called iBrevery and if you try to, if you set your book and then check it against iBrevery, you can see if you get it right. <laughs> and if you miss, you can, you can kind of see patterns emerge. You're like, oh, this is what I do on this particular kind of day. Um, or if there's a monastery near you or you're you have access to a group that prays the Liturgy of the Hours on a regular basis, um, just join in. And then after you do it for a couple of weeks, you, you kind of know what you're doing, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you can watch videos online. Um, uh, looks like you have a resource. Yeah, you can oh, the yeah, yeah. So it's wonderful. <laughs> there's, uh, there's all kinds of published material. And, uh, and that's, that's, a great, that's a great resource, yeah. And check, and, and check um, after, afterwards with her if you're interested in that. Um, there are a number of other resources. Father Raymond's going to be passing around a sheet with, um, with some of my recommendations. Um, at the bottom, I list kind of contemporary resources. This is a great little book called The School of Prayer. And a lot of the historical stuff's in here. But it's also kind of a guide for going deeper into the Psalms if you're interested in um, learning more about particular hours, particular parts of the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, this was published in the 90s, I think. Um, it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty accessible and good book. Um, um, Father Timothy Gallagher has a, has a pretty good um, take on the Liturgy, but just his personal experience with it, how it was hard for him to make that a part of his priestly life, and how he kind of learned to love the Liturgy of the Hours. So if you find them a little bit um, not helpful for your prayer life, this might be a good book to understand a little bit better how you can make that prayerful, um, to, to, to read the office prayerfully, to chant it prayerfully. At the top of your handouts, I list kind of scripture verses that allude to how Christian prayer should, should be, um, or those passages I read about the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour um, from the Acts of the Apostles. I list some of those passages. This is not an exhaustive list. It's just a few passages that are, that are nice. Um, and then I have a list of regent, recent magisterial um, documents, specifically about the Liturgy of the Hours. Um, Mediator Dei is kind of the first in the, in the big liturgical movement of the 20th century. Pius XII wrote that. And that was sort of the precursor to the Vatican II document on the liturgy, which has an entire chapter dedicated to the Liturgy of the Hours. There's only like five chapters in that document, and one chapter is dedicated to this. That's, um, that's invaluable reading. Um, there's the general instruction for the Liturgy of the Hours. It's found in volume one of the set. And that's good for reading if you're learning the mechanics and just kind of want the general sense of how these things work and why they're structured the way they are. Um, the Catechism has an excellent couple paragraphs on the Liturgy of the Hours. That's, that's, you could read that in a minute. And that's um, really, really good um, content. And then hi, I want to really highly recommend these two sets of Wednesday audiences. So John Paul II, his last, his very last 
set of teachings that he gave us as Pope, they were on the Psalms. And he thought it would be important to teach the laity the Psalms because he saw the value of the Liturgy of the Hours. So I think, I think that's significant coming from, um, from a Pope and from a saint and a man who had a very deep prayer life. So there are these excellent Wednesday audiences on individual Psalms. So if you get the weird Psalm and you're like, I don't know who the King of Sheba is, you can pick up John Paul II and then Benedict XVI finished him because John Paul um, passed away before he could finish teaching us the Psalms. And uh, Benedict finished it as his first act as Pope, and he thought it was important. And, uh, and as you know, both, both, um, both of those churchmen, are, um, um, they, they offer us um, rich spiritual content, and uh, they've been great guides in the prayer life. And then at the bottom, I just have some kind of modern writers that, that have written on the Liturgy of the Hours or on the Psalms in particular. Um, I've not read them all. I've read most of these, um, but just, just some places to look if you're interested in going deeper. Um, and that's, um, that's, that's the basic gist, gist of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, um, I wanted to say more. There's just so much you could say on the Liturgy of the Hours. That's it's a lot of content for an hour, like a 45-minute talk. But uh, um, I was happy to, to present what I did tonight. And uh, thank you for having me. I know we usually take a break at this time, um, but because we're already going to have the prayer, kind of a transition to that, if Brother Bernard's up for it, would you mind answering some questions now? Sure. Great. Your name's here. Hello, Brother, Father Bernard, Brother Bernard. Bernard. <laughs> um, since energizing my spiritual life with the divine office which began my wife and I took a honeymoon for five days at our Abbey of Gethsemane oh, nice. in Kentucky and five years ago I might add and uh, ever since then I've been getting up at three o'clock in the morning we were just really taken with the uh, importance significance and frankly the, the the more than the love just the delight of the daily divine office so i'd like to talk for a half hour what i do <laughs> but i will only say from a lay perspective yes, there is a very really neat way to pursue the liturgy of the hours and from my standpoint having been born catholic Catholic education above and beyond, married and umpteen children and grandchildren, it has not posed a problem to keep up the daily uh, liturgy of the hours mm -hmm. and incorporating it. My spirituality and Catholic faith understanding, both pastorally and theologically, mm -hmm. it's all there. Yep. And today you're your own brother, father, St. Ambrose, just beautiful yes. uh, way of living. Enough said. Thank you for tonight. Thank you, Bernie. Other questions? Um, you mentioned it was preferable to pray the Liturgy of the Hours with a group. Yes. Right? And then you drew the uh, connection between the rosary and the um, liturgy hours. So would you say the same thing about the rosary, that it's a more of a group prayer no. and not a solo prayer? That's an interesting thought. Um, actually, I don't, I don't know that I did mention the rosary, but that's, I'm glad you did mention it because I thought that would be something neat to just incorporate into the talk. But traditionally, the rosary has 15 decades, so 150 Hail Marys which correspond with 150 psalms. So the, I, think, I think this had various nicknames, but it was like the short brief or the short office or the short liturgy of the hours. You know, if you, if you couldn't read, and a lot of lay monks that couldn't read, and they were kind of the, the worker monks, there were, they were di different designations in monasteries. They would pray their rosaries instead of going to the office. And it um, wasn't always ideal because you want the whole monastery at the office. Um, but yeah, this is a, it's a devotional prayer. It's not a liturgical prayer. So um, 
it's probably more um, flexible in that way since it's not liturgical strictly speaking that as a devotion um, it can be prayed privately and uh, and have specific benefits in that regard and then specific benefits in a group I think the church don't quote me on that I mean I, I don't know for sure but you might check into this the church offers an indulgence for praying the rosary in specific circumstances I know for praying it in front of the blessed sacrament I, I want to say maybe there's an indulgence for praying it in a group mm-hmm. but there is okay yeah. good so that's probably a clue uh, if, if the church is doing that then that might be uh, the church's way of saying this is this is a, a, a better way of doing it um, but uh, but to pray it privately is uh, of course um, acceptable and that's been done for ages um, and by many saints I was wondering if you could say something about the obligation uh, that priests and religious have to pray the divine office and, and like what that obligation looks like and what maybe even the reason for it. Oh, great, yeah. Um, so priests, um, clergy, I should say, of the church are required to pray the full office. So um, they, uh, they have a duty as, uh, as members of, um, as, as having received orders and participating in the priesthood of Christ in a very um, um, unique way to pray the Liturgy of the Hours on a continuous basis. Religious, um, it, it's kind of different with religious um, because you have sisters and brothers who are obviously not ordained and uh, it depends on the constitutions to my knowledge of that congregation, what their commitment is to the Liturgy of the Hours. In more contemplative groups, you see um, the constitutions state that it's mandatory. So you'll see a lot of monks and nuns in convents and monasteries who have to pray the full office. Um, our constitutions for the Dominicans, uh, for the men, we have to pray the full office. Um, but for other, other groups, societies of apostolic life, um, other congregations, um, I think it, it just kind of varies a little bit. Um, and then, of course, the laity have no obligations as far as the Liturgy of the Hours go. It's an odd thing, in fact, that, you know, we both take on the obligation of praying it in making our vows as Dominicans, but then also with ordination bef- before the church, there's the public promise to pray the liturgy of the hours. And you might say, well, why is that redundant? You know, why do we do two? Mm-hmm. Um, but it's precisely that, I think, you know, we see religious pray the office for their own sanctification in, in large part. Now, they're also at the heart of the church praying for the whole church, but um, priests, deacons, bishops, clergy pray it um, in an official way, much the much the same way they offer mass, an official way on behalf of the church and for the people of God. And I remember a priest preaching once on how when you ask a priest to pray for you, um, you know he may in fact just kind of mentally connect that to the liturgy of the hours. You know, yes, he may offer specific prayers for it, but it's highly appropriate to. And sometimes you'll see this in our in our communities when we'll mention someone who we're including in prayer, the way we do at Mass, you know, someone who's sick or someone who's uh, near death, we'll mention at the end of the petitions that are already in the book, we'll mention that, that spontaneous petition too. So it's, I think that's important, you know, uh, an important reminder for us too, and just that it's an official, it's a prayer we're not playing merely for ourselves. And when lay people, as a matter of um, devotion, enter into that, um, they're also becoming a part of the, the church at prayer. So, Any last question before we um, move and pray ourselves? <laughs> Did you have a question? Or, no? okay. Just a, a, an additional point. I find that the divine office is it's really a journey. It's a journey through the scripture and it's a journey through the church year. And it's absolutely fascinating beginning with the first and going through the whole year and underlining and all that sort of thing mm-hmm. and coming back the second year and picking up yeah. it's just a delightful compla- compilation of as you said at the beginning brother mm-hmm. the Old Testament the important parts of it mm-hmm. and then into the, the readings of the church fathers yeah. it's just magnificent yeah. it is church yeah it's a, it's a cycle but each round you go deeper and deeper and deeper Um, there's repetition but you can go deep
Yeah. It's, it's easier to pick up the second year around because yes. your underlines. <laughs> yes. One of our priests said that uh, in Anvishad, I remember him telling us, you'll, you'll be doing this in years, years from now, and you'll say a line will jump out, and you'll say, has that been in there all this time? You know, <laughs> if I read that at least once a year, uh, or in the, psalm, in the case of the Psalms, you know, once a month yeah. uh, at the very least. Um, very good. Well, why don't we go ahead and conclude. Let's thank Brother Berner, first of all. Thank you, God.